slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the faith of the same kind of ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you, through the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and majesty. For through these things, did I skip something already? <laughs> For through these, for by these he has granted to us his precious and excellent promises, in order that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence supply knowledge, in your knowledge supply self-discipline, in your self-discipline, supply perseverance. In your perseverance, supply godliness. In your godliness, <coughs> supply brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, supply love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. For he, who does, for he who lacks these qualities is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten him, the purification of his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain of his calling and choosing of you. For as, lo um, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, your entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth that is present with you. For I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of a reminder, knowing that the um, laying aside of my earthly dwelling is eminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made known to me. And so I will also be diligent, so that at any time after my departure you may be able to recall these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him from the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made out from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which we do well to pay attention, as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men, being moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, that preacher of righteousness, along with seven others, as when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to all who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sexual conduct of unprincipled men, 
For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among them was tormented day after day by their, in his righteous soul, by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. But especially those who indulge in the flesh, those who have desires, and despise authority, daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born as creatures of instinct, to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will, in the destruction of those creatures, also be destroyed. Suffering wrong, from, as the wages of doing wrong, they consider it, they find it a pleasure, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, <clears throat> enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way of life, they have gone astray, and following the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his transgression. The mute donkey, speaking with the voice of the man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are like springs without water, am I right? These are springs without water, mists driven by the storm, for whom the gloom of darkness is reserved. For while speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice our fleshly desires by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. Promising to them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what anyone is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if, after having escaped the entanglements of the world, by means of the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become for them worse than the first. For it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment that was handed down to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow after washing returns to vomit in the field. And the liar. This is, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, by which I am stirring up your pure, your sincere minds by way of a reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. But know this first of all. In the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For while they maintain this, it escapes their notice, that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by, the word, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that one day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient with you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. For by his word, no, oh, let's see, that the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and its works will be burned up. So that's it. Wow, you were amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Dear Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for the promises embedded in it. Thank you for the hope embedded in it. Thank you that your judgment and your justice is real. <coughs> and we can count on you to be absolutely just and fair. But I also want to thank you for the grace that you've infused into the whole way that you work. And uh, help us to study this and to learn what this is all about today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so let's get started on that part. First word is but. And it says it is trying to set up a contrast. So we have contrast with the flood. There's, he's talked about the destruction of Noah and the flood. And he goes, but there's the present heavens are being reserved for fire. So this is a contrast to what's going on right now. And we are in the reserved part. And I thought this was really cool. He uses by his word. This one is Lagos. I told you last year, last, last year, last week. <laughs> A little bit like on my mind, so I'm if I stumble, it's for you. <laughs> so I told you last week the difference between Lagos and Rama, which is the two words for word used in the Bible, and one refers to specific words that are spoken like to us. Like when we read a verse that says, um, "Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths." They might call that. Rhema. That would be spelled like this. Because those are a specific set of words directed towards us. Whereas if you're talking about the Word of God like the whole Bible, or you're talking about Jesus Christ, or you're talking about the big concept, you're going to use Logos. So that's just... Well, you would not ever pick that up in English because it's word or it's word. You would have no clue which one he's talking about. This one is by his word, Lagos. So when he says by his word, the present, uh, heavens are being reserved, it's the big picture. And it's actually almost a play on words because Lagos also refers to Jesus Christ. And if you go look up, um, oh, I'll jump down here. Uh, Hebrews 1 3 or Colossians 1 16 and 17 it tells us that Jesus Christ is actually the one sustaining the word and the thing so here we have the word of God his actual word that he says but also the person of God who is sustaining it is Jesus Christ which I thought was a really cool little picture with the words and uh one of the reasons why I, I like looking at the Greek words to see which ones they are to say there. But go find Colossians 1, 15, 1, 16 and 17. Somebody read that. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Yes, that all things hold together, that's specifically state, uh, this is the exact same thing in, in um, Second Peter that he's talking about. It's being held together. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is the one holding mm -hmm. it together. And that's why I thought that he used the word word, and the word is good. Cool picture. And then um, <coughs> Hebrews 1 3 says something like that too, and that's one's about Jesus Christ also. Yeah. Okay. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and upholds the universe by the word of his power. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So, yes. So we are in a... We're, Peter's been talking about a state of time where there was creation. He made a big deal about that. And then there was destruction. And it was done by water. And there's going to be another destruction. And it's going to be done by fire. And it's going to be done, this was done by the word of God. 
this was done by the Word of God, this is going to be done by the Word of God, and the sustaining time in the middle is done by the Word of God. So, is he in control? Um, apparently. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. So it says that um, by the Word of God. Now, there's some other ones. Isaiah 48. Does anybody know that? You, should, you probably do not. You probably do if you don't know what this reference are. It says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So out of all these things that are going to be destroyed, it's the law of us. The word of the Lord. Not only the Lord himself, but his words. And that's really cool. That's really cool. I love that. I love that his words stand for that. Peter actually is going to quote Isaiah 48 in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 2.25, he quotes that. Or he gets like, it's a very similar quote. Let's see where that is. I just like threw that in there and I didn't check it. <laughs> Is that Isaiah? No, this in First Peter. What's the Isaiah? The Isaiah forty-eight. Isaiah forty-eight, First Peter. Uh, it's one twenty-four. Your notes are wrong. I put it down wrong. Sorry. And. Um, and it's not 25 either, it's 24. But it says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Isn't that cool? I love that. Okay, so the other one is the, the Matthew 24, 35, is what Jesus said. probably be visiting uh, Matthew 24 several times today. Ah, this is Jesus' quote. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So I, I like that. That's a good setup. I think Peter was, when he, when the Holy Spirit could, uh, inspired him to start like this, He's going to talk about everything being destroyed, so he lays a foundation. What's secure? I, that's really cool. Um, the present heavens are being reserved for fire. The word reserved is theo uh, rizo, <coughs> and uh, it's a place where something is kept. It used to be used as a treasure chest. So I thought, don't know if there's any meaning in that, but it's a place where things are to be kept. Just as a total side note, a thesaurus comes from this word, the word for treasury, because it's a treasury of words. Just that just has nothing to do with anything other than uh, it's interesting to me. So, um, and fire is pure, and uh, the fire always refers to judgment. So I thought, let's look up some of these. Daniel seven. So here we have a picture of God, and we're going to have some pictures of him with fire. So we have some characteristics of God going on. <coughs> and right now we're going to see he is just. And we've just gone through this really difficult chapter, too. And things have to be made right. And these people have attacked his church. These people have attacked people who, with false information. And you wonder, sometimes you go, is God going to do anything? And so this is about how God deals with justice. 
We have justice. We're also going to have um, the next one coming up is patience. And so how this, the whole thing that Peter's uh, dealing with in this passage is how his patience and justice work together. Because from man's viewpoint, if you're looking at God's patience, you don't see any justice. And if you're looking at God's justice, you don't see any grace or patience at all. I mean, when people read the Old Testament and they're not paying attention to all the stuff that they're saying, they're reading, oh, and God destroyed this, and God destroyed this, and God destroyed this, and God destroyed this, and now, oh, yeah, it's no grace at all. And, but you didn't read where he said, all these times where he said, if you do this, this is going to happen, and then he waits a thousand years for it to do it. That, that's quite a bit of patience, you know. And he, so it's a patience and justice thing going on, and, and both are true. Both are completely true. And it's really hard if you are in the waiting stage. When is justice actually going to, when is God going to do what he says he's going to do? When is justice going to happen? How do we get through this waiting stage? How do we do that? You know, um, things like that happen. Things are hard. And so, like, you've been waiting, you've been praying for someone to believe in Christ for 20 years and nothing's happening and nothing's happening and nothing's happening or how about all of us who have a prodigal kid somewhere and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting and how do we get through that and is God ever going to do what he said he's going to do so this is what Peter's addressing right now how do we blend those two and the first thing he's going to stand us up with is this is true and this right here cannot be, will not ever be messed with. Okay, so it was true back here, it was true here, it's going to be true here, and it's true in the middle. We just get to live in this middle time. So, this is so one of the, well, I would be jumping ahead on my notes, but one of the things that crossed my mind was that. God said at the very beginning of this book that he wants us to become partakers of the divine nature. And he's going to show us what patience looks like. And I'm going, oh, do I have to do that one? Um, that's not one of our easiest ones to do. We will do patience for a couple hours or whatever. And then we go, no, this is not... Anybody, like... One time, I just thought of this, one time. One time, um, my husband was not one of those guys who celebrated events, very much. So if Valentine's Day came and nothing happened, I had to learn not to have my feelings hurt because that's just not his thing. He, he may bring me some really sweet, wonderful thing on, I don't know, March 3rd or something that had nothing to do with anything, but he wouldn't remember February 14th. So, uh, Knowing that, it was February 14th one year, one day, uh, about 20-something years ago, and I'm out doing something. And I'm supposed to be home by 4, 3.30, 4, 4.30, around, somewhere around there. And I'm, I'm just <coughs> staying busy. I mean, we don't have cell phones at that time, so I, I didn't anyway, so it wasn't, and I just, I wasn't able to call him, and I, whatever. And it didn't make any difference, because... It, we weren't going to do it. We hadn't done anything for 20 years on February 14th. So I drive up at 6.30, only to find out that he had made reservations at one of the nicest restaurants in Amador County. And as I drive up, he's on the phone canceling it. Oh. And I'm going, if you just have a little bit more patience. But no. So that's how we are. You know? And uh, yeah, that, that didn't go over very well. There. I don't know why. That <laughs> so, um, patience. I was thinking, I was wishing you had just a tad, tad bit more patience. We would have gotten there on time. And I'd have my fancy dinner on Valentine's Day that I never got. So, uh, although the last Valentine's Day, he said, um, I can't get to the store. Go buy yourself some pretty flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't get to the store. He, he 
wasn't able to. I thought that was pretty sweet. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, bought, I went and bought some um, uh, ones to plant rather than the cut ones. And so his favorite was uh, pansies, and so I bought pansies. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm way off. <laughs> okay, so in Dan, and there's a whole bunch of, um, and this, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in Daniel that describes God's justice, and it's done with fire. So uh, Daniel nine, I mean Daniel seven nine through nine through ten. And this is Daniel in his dream. And Daniel got all these wonderful visions and such. And he says, I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. And his vesture was like white snow. And his hair on his head was like pure wool. By the way, if you read Revelation 1, this will be very similar. Um, and the, his throne was ablaze with flames. And his wheel, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. And the court sat, and the books were open. I'm like, oh, that sounds like judgment, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so there's that. There's Micah. Mike is right after John. Micah 1, 3, and 4. Behold, the Lord is, for behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. And he will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be split. Like wax before a fire, like water pours down a steep place. So these are all Old Testament. See, Peter is the only person in the New Testament that actually describes a judgment by fire. This is the only place it is. So there are, but there are Old Testament prophecies that allude to this. So that's what we're going through. So that this is the Peter. You won't find that any place else that Peter, where you'll find a judgment on fire. Peter has this one. Okay, Malachi 4 1. Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So that not so that it will not leave them neither root nor branch. <coughs> so that sounds. As a matter of fact, if I was uh, uh, living in the time of Malachi and, or even during the time in between the Testaments, and that was one of the last words that came from God, that would just like I don't know be hard. But there is the promise of Elijah right after that. So that's cool. Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings lit up the world. <coughs> the earth saw and trembled. The mountains melted at the, like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. I thought, wow, and that's talking about righteousness and justice are before his throne. So we are dealing with a huge judgment that is coming. It's not a judgment by water. We can't have a judgment by water because of the promise of the rainbow, right? You can't have that. So it's a destruction by fire. Just 
So we already keep this in mind. He has kept it in overview for the day of judgment. He has guarded this for this one particular day when that comes. And it's going to be the destruction. You've had these words before. Of, we've had apoleia for destruction. We've had judgment is crisis. Day is hemera. We've had these. Asabaya, godless men. Do you remember at the beginning, you know the list at the beginning of Second uh, Peter when it says you are to, um, to uh, I just quoted it, let's see, what does it say? You start with, um, well the second one is knowledge, and the third one is self-discipline, and the fourth one is um, perseverance, and the fifth one is godliness. Godliness is used to buy it. That's E U S E D I A. This means good, and this means reverence. So it's like good reverence or uh, respect for God, good, high quality opinion of God, and all that. So this one, this ungodly one, is Ah Sabaya. Ah is your negative. So this is your unrespectfulness. Your unworship. Your un. There's this. Peter has filled Second Peter with opposite contrasting words all the time. That's what this is right here. We had the one, this is the other. So. Ah, but don't let this one thing escape your notice. That one day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. So that is um, Lanthano. Lanthano is to be hidden or concealed from, and we are, this is the same word that was used in verse 5 of the third chapter, it says, uh, But while they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens were... Okay, so he's now using the exact same word, just a few couple verses later, saying, But don't let this escape your notice. So there's another contrast. He's doing this all over the place. So they, they paid no attention to the fact that God created the universe and that he destroyed it with a flood. But now we don't want this to escape our notice. And he says, to, again, to us, beloved, which is agapa, agapate. Uh, it's, a, it's from ag, um, agape, but it's not. I'm trying to put it into the noun, and I can't get it. But anyway, um, that's what he's calling us. He's calling us agape, okay? And uh, so don't let this escape your notice. This willfully to let it escape. So you've got to remember that for God, he functions differently in time than we do. We actually visualize time based on our frame of reference of time. And the reason I say this is because for me, right now, a year is a short period of time. But for little grandchildren, a year is forever. Because their frame of reference is what, five years, and so this is a fifth of their life. Well, for me, a year is, I don't know, a little tiny bit, you know? If you're a century old, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a one percent of your life. So we visualize to the best that we have. If we visualize the entire length of human history, approximately 6,000 years, that's, and we think, huge. No, it's not. It's little. It's very little. As a matter of fact, God can't even, God doesn't even view it like that because he doesn't even exist in his existence within the realm of time anyway. So he exists outside of time. He functions in time, but he exists outside of time. I don't even know how that works because that's, it has no beginning and, and eternity is for him. I like to change the words from eternity, from infinity, Infinity to eternity, because eternity to me, the way I visualize it is, um, I have a start, I get to live my life, I get to die, and then I get to keep living forever. 
And that's how I picture eternity. But it had a start for me, whereas for God it didn't. So I call it infinity, so that it had no start that way and had no start that way. And this is like, because I don't know of any single thing in my entire realm of existence that did not have a start, I cannot wrap my brain around that. I can almost wrap my brain around this. Not really, but kind of. Um, but that one, no, I can't wrap my brain around that. So, um, but he, he can. It's no big deal for him. And he says his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and all that kind of stuff. And so his vision of time is higher than this. When he looks at this, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, because it's not, it's not looked at in the same way. And um, it does not mean that to God, one day is exactly a thousand years, and a thousand years is exactly one day, because there's this little word in here called host. There's two words for host. There's this host, and this host. This host means that... This host means as, and this is the one that we have. And as sets up like an analogy comparison. It doesn't set up that this one day is. A, I've heard people actually say this, and I've used this for why the Earth was created in six thousand days, okay, or six thousand years, all right, instead of because of the one day as a thousand years. So. So I'm, I'm reading all these stuff, this, and this one guy um, tells a joke, so I'm going to try to tell this guy's joke. <laughs> I'm not very good at jokes, so we'll see if I can pull this off. Um, an economist, you know, has a conversation with God, and he says, so I hear that um, one day is like a thousand years. God says, well, yeah. He goes, well, if that's the case, it is one penny like a million dollars. guy says... I says, well, yeah. He goes, oh, can I have one of those pennies? And I says, well, wait a minute. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> okay. So much for me being humorous. I thought it was good. I, yeah, I, I, I pulled that one off all right. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, one day is like a thousand years. So this is a, uh, if that if that was the case, then you realize that Jesus rose two days ago. Wouldn't that be like? I mean, wouldn't that be change your? Kind of gives me goosebumps, you know. It was two days ago. Is that close? So that, that's kind of cool. Um, <coughs> Peter's actually quoting Psalm 90. And since I was already close, or close to, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or like as a watch in the night. That's where he gets this. That's pretty cool. That was written by Moses, by the way. All right, so the Lord is not slow about his promise. Um, the word, it means to carry, loiter, delay, be tardy, delay beyond the expected time. And he is not like that. The not is an oop. I showed you oop in May. Here's this one. This is O U C can't write. O U C H. This is M E. This is an absolute. Absolute no. This is like a mostly no. Or uh, like when you say no, but your kid can finally wiggle the yes out of you. Mm -hmm. Right? This is when you say absolutely no, and there's no room for wiggling, and your kid, no matter what they do, will never get it out of you. Yeah. 
So he is absolutely not slow about his promise. And that is exactly what the other guys are saying is what was wrong. Remember the, the mockers who come with their mocking? That's what they're saying. This isn't going to happen because it's just not going to happen because he's not doing it. So, Okay, there is a couple times when God is slow. I want you to go find when <coughs> God is slow. Okay, so one is in Exodus 34, and it's verses 6 and 7. Go, somebody go find that. I want you to see when God is slow. wasn't slow to anger, I'd be dead by now. <laughs> yes. It also says that in Psalm 86, 15, and in Isaiah 30, verse 18. God is slow to anger. He is. 86 is just right here. But you, O Lord, are God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. So there is a time when he's slow. It's a good thing. But he's not slow about keeping his promises, um, as some consider slowness. Now, when they can't say that some count slowness, that word count is uh, a mathematical <coughs> term to carefully consider out the calculations. And so someone has... The, the scoffers, the mockers, are like saying, I've carefully figured this out, and God is not, if he is slow, he's not going to do it. Sound, sounds to me like, um, like uh, the uh, evolutionists who say they have so carefully figured everything out and have put their brains to it and done massive amounts of study <coughs> in a whole category that doesn't even work to start with, which is, is sad that their brains have spent that much time on that kind of stuff. It really is. So, it's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient. All right, we've got to deal with patience. Suffering. It means, what do I have on here? You have a very long fuse. You are slow to anger, slow to punish. You have self-restraint in the midst of provocation. That's that's all. These things are in slow to retaliate. That's all within this word that God has. And I can find. If you just think out your stories of the Old Testament, you can find times when. He's every one of those. He's slow to retaliate. He's patient in provocation. He's, I mean, how many times did they put idols right where the temple, um, um, right in the temple? They put, I, they would take out the altar of sacrifice and put the idol in there. <coughs> they actually moved it. And I, uh, and God, and he didn't send down fire from heaven and just blow them up, you know? Yeah. That's a description, by the way, of what the abomination of desolation is supposed to be. It's where that some, when the, uh, I'm jumping into uh, Steve's eschatology class. And, uh, but it's when they, when the Antichrist or whoever is doing this, or his prophet or the, the, uh, the, the guys that are working together take the a statue that's an idol and put it inside the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant should be. 
and that's called the abomination of desolation. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> that's really, really, really not a good thing. Yeah. That's not in today's study. That's just <laughs> me going off. So um, there's a lot of times when God was very patient. Um, he was patient for 120 years while the ark was being constructed. Uh, Mo uh, Moses, Noah taught, preached for 120 years, and he got seven positive responses. Somebody figured that out, and that was about like one for every 18.3.759 years of preaching. Talk about discouraging. And he would say, God, are you slow about your promise? I mean, you could see him, but that's what, that's what he did. Yeah. Can you imagine how discouraging that would be if you went through that long? I do know that um, Adoniram Judson, the guy who went to Burma for the first time, he preached and was there for like, if I can remember correctly, five, six, seven years before he got his first convert. Wow, huh? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he remained faithful with that. That's quite a, quite a story there. Yeah. So, um, another time, God was very patient with Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, can you imagine sitting there and listening to Abraham in, in the sea? And how patient did God have to be when Abraham goes through the number? Okay, God, if there's 50, okay, I won't do it for 50. And you know, God knows that he's going to say 45 next. And then he knows he's going to say 40. He could have just jumped to it and said, Abraham, I won't do it for 10. You know, <laughs> that would have been. But he didn't. He let Abraham go through all those little steps. Which is really, really nice. How many times have I gone to God and said, Okay, well, you know, and brought all these silly prayers, <coughs> and he's gone. Okay, Debbie, we can't do that. We can't do that because you're not looking to what I'm seeing. You know, there. I did hear this story recently about a lady who um, she's all in her thirties. She gets this horrible, horrible indigestion. She gets such horrible pain in her lower abdomen that she has to be hospitalized. And when she gets in there, they can't quite figure it out. She's in there for a day, for seven days, this intensive, horrible, she's praying that God will either kill her or take her take her home or take it away, one of the two. And after the seven days, the surgeon comes in and he goes, I am so glad you've had all this pain. He goes, because if you hadn't had all this pain, we wouldn't have figured this out. And her colon had actually just come loose from her body. So, and she says later, she goes, I think God was in tears um, having to say no to her prayers so that those doctors could find that solution. And she, her, her viewpoint on it afterwards was so <coughs> sweet and so gracious. I thought, I wonder if I would have even been able to look at it from that viewpoint afterwards. I would have said, God, why don't you do something to this sooner, you know? But here she did it like that. She goes, I think God was just in tears having to say no to my prayers while I was, while this was getting figured out. Mm -hmm. uh, what a divine viewpoint she took on that. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. So, yeah, he's, that's his patience. And uh, there's another time when he waited really patiently, and that was when he was giving the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham. And part of that covenant is... You're going to get, there's three main parts to that covenant. You're going to get, have a huge giant family, which would have sounded like a joke to Abraham at the time since he's 90 years old or whatever, and he's not had any kids. And you're going to have so many kids that you can't even count the stars of the sky or the sand. <coughs> and I'm thinking, okay, God, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and then he's also going to have the land. He's going to get the land. He's living on the land at the time. And he's also going to get, um, one of those descendants is going to bless the entire world, all the families of the world. He doesn't know what that means particularly. Maybe he knows more about it when it comes a little while later, when he has to deal with Isaac on the altar. 
and he probably gets a bigger picture of what's going on. But the one in the middle, the land, he, he's living on the land, and God says, I will give you this land in 400 years. Well, I'm right here, but I should just like, give me the land right now. I'm, I'm here. He goes, I'll give you this land in 400 years. And he goes, because the sin of the Amorites is not complete yet. This is a huge piece of patience towards those people. So I'm sure there's other ones, but those are the three that came to mind. Um, yeah. So he's not wishing for any of us to perish. Here's a, the word wishing. Is fool am I? And I showed you, I've been asked a couple times about free will and where do we actually find concepts like that in the Bible. So there's um, Thura, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not Thela, it's Thela. And this is Bulamay. Okay, this is T, oops, H E L O, and this is B O U L O M A I. Now, uh, the reason I'm going to go into this is because this verse has been used for, since God is not willing that any should perish, for the uh, um, teaching of universal salvation. Has anybody heard that? No? I heard that, that this verse has been used for the teaching of universal salvation. Mm -hmm. um, the only way you can make that happen is to take it out of context because what's just like two verses before, it says that he's going to destroy ungodly men. He's going to judge of the ungodly men. Um, so when that was in what? Verse 5, 6, 7. The destruction of ungodly men. So, if he's going to have a destruction of ungodly men, then he's not saving everybody. But he's not willing that any should perish. So, how do you deal with this, right? He's not willing. So, uh, this is the word he is not willing for any to perish. This is in um, our verse nine here, and we had this one last week, fellow, and so. This one is your deep desire, the deep desire of your heart, your will, what you want, your wish, everything you wish, everything you want, that's your bulamai. The decisions that you actually make are your thelo. So there's a difference between these two. This one is translated willing. This one is translated willing. <coughs> okay? So God is not willing, it is not his desire, it is not his wish, it is not his want for any to perish, but he has willed back in the garden when he created us in his image to make us free moral agents. If he's going to make us a free moral agent, he has to give us by his own will our free will. And so, our free will has to coincide with his will for salvation to happen. That's what it's saying. And by the use of the two words, you figure that out. If you take this verse out of context in English, you say, God is not willing for any to perish. Okay, then no one's going to perish. Because God's going to get what he wants. But you, you have to skip two verses in front of it and two verses behind it to accomplish that. You have to just like rip it out of its context. And that's one of the cardinal rules of learning the Bible is you do not take anything out of context. You keep it in context. So this is not a verse for universal salvation. Just letting you know that. Um, yeah. Um, by the fact that it says that what it says up here... He is not wishing for any of you to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Koreo down there a little bit is where you, that's our part of it. It's where we make room or give place for something. It is like, okay, um, God is presenting the information to you. 
And you, and the Holy Spirit is helping you clearly understand. Because if he doesn't do that, you're not going to understand. You've got to have that because otherwise it just goes over your head. Right? So clearly understand. Now you have to say, you just got to make room. It's this tiny little piece that is described as making room in yourself to receive this. And that's all it is. That's you deciding to do that. Those who decide not to do that, turn that away. Uh, I have, I can think of twice, and I'm sure there's been more times, but twice specifically when I've watched this happen. And I was, it was the day after 9-11. And my friend had gotten killed two days before 9-11 by getting hit by a car as she crossed the street. All right, so it's now it's the two days. In the meantime, in those th in those three days, um, her family comes all the way, gathers in California, so that they are here for her funeral and whatnot, and all this. And one of those people worked in the Pentagon, and so he is out of the Pentagon on the day the Pentagon gets hit, and he. They call me up. What a day. They call me up. The very <coughs> unbelieving family, borderline atheistic family, and they say, um, but it happens to be that my friend, I did get to witness to my friend one time, and I heard her say, I believe that, which is all I ever got. But that's the little piece I'm hanging on to for my friend that got hit. Okay, so I'm called in, and I get this phone call that says, um, I need you, we need you to come right now. We want to know if God killed our mom to save the son. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. So, there's family everywhere and grand and kids run out. So I bring presents for all the kids. I do everything I can to try to, like, and I get in there and I <coughs> did my very best with no, God did not kill your mom to save you, you know you, but He is now providing for you a thing, and we and that was the top. They asked me to come talk about that, so it's not like I'm coming in there and bombarding them with the information. They asked me for the information, and we all sit down, and it's like it's, it's like facing a firing squad, and um, yeah, and they said, you know what? If God had just come down here to earth and tell me, then I'd believe that. And I'm thinking, no, you wouldn't. I didn't say that. I'd say, no, you wouldn't. Because he did. And that was my answer. Yeah. And they rejected it. Boom! Like that. And I walked away and left in tears. And I've had a hard time having much of a connection with that family ever since. But they have this perfect opportunity, and God is at laying repentance and patience and forgiveness and all that right in front of them. And, you know, there was another time when this happened when I was at a thing and I was asked to come, and there was a whole bunch of teenage girls, and one of them, they call me up and they go, one of these girls wants to talk to you about Jesus Christ. So I go there, and I also am not starting this conversation. I was called there, so I'm telling this girl about how to believe in Jesus Christ, and she just looks at me and she goes, that's too easy. No. Because she wanted her good works to hold her, she wanted this to hold her, and she was just like that. That's too easy. No. And the no was not like, no, it was it was not like the may no that maybe I can talk her out of it. It was the ink no, and I thought, okay, I'm stopping because that's not happening. So this is where man's free will is not coinciding with God's will, and He was not willing that any of those people should perish. That He was wanting to be patient with them, and fortunately, they're all. Alive, to my knowledge. I don't know about the girl. 
Um, I know the other family is. But and I still pray for those people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's our job, is just to keep on praying that God will work in their lives and the circumstances mm -hmm. right, and their hearts and soften. You know, he does not force his will on any man. But he certainly can work in the circumstances yes. and hearts. And he can bring a lot of things to their memories. Yeah. And he can do a lot of that. And so I'm not giving up on that. As a matter of fact, there was I was reading Spurgeon. Spurgeon says um, that he often prays for like, oh, come, day of the Lord, Lord Jesus, please come. And then he goes, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> I have people I know that haven't believed yet. So there's this wonderful graciousness about don't come yet. We've got work to do. We've got people that need to know still that haven't responded yet. So, we, I, you know, there's a lot of times when I'm really tired, worn out, and things are going bad, and the, the faucet under the sink is broken again, and da, 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 you know, on and on and on, and you go, oh, can't we just have the rapture right now, you know? Or put up, and then, oh, well, wait a minute, this is nothing compared to the seriousness of those who wouldn't be saved if God wasn't patient. So, yeah, he's patient. So there's this combination. And if you were, it, it, I put the words in here, but it, can you come down here? It says he's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That core, that choreo there, C-H-O-R-E-O, is the tiny little piece that is man's part. Whereas the repentance is something God actually gives us. Just like he makes the explanation of the gospel clear to the unbeliever with the Holy Spirit, there's several verses in here that, that I found that said that God granted to them repentance. But they had to make room for it. So there's always there's always a tiny piece that applies. The piece is so tiny, there's no merit in it because... Um, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So the faith is somewhat of a, is a gift. The repentance is a gift. The fact that you even understand the gospel when it is said to you because it doesn't make sense to the human mind, that's a gift. But there's this tiny piece that says, did you make room for that? And that's our only, that's, that's the, that piece right there decides whether a person goes to hell or not. And God has done this huge part, and there's this tiny little speck, and then he said, no, nah, I don't have room for that. Which breaks my heart, you know? And I'm sure it does God's. I'm sure it breaks his heart. Because he is not his bull of mine. His deepest desires are no one should perish. But he is also this. He's justice. So he has to. He has to. And let's go look up, uh, it's in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, 23. This is, Ezekiel is written when God has had to seriously discipline his people, uh, so much so that he has had to pull them out of their country and take them as captives to Babylon. And Ezekiel is during this time. And there's all kinds of disasters and devastation and horrible things going on. And the temple's being destroyed and people are dying all over the place. It's Ezekiel 18.23. And in the midst of this, he says, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Lord. Rather than that he should turn from his ways and live. That's what God wants. And he says it again in 33.11. <coughs> I say to them, 
As I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? So that's God's desire. That's what he wishes. So now we get down to metanoia. That's repentance. Metanoia. Metanoia is a word that is actually, if you were to translate it into an army um, um, book of instructions, what it, it would be about face. It means to change your mind and turn about face. You're going this way, you're supposed to do whatever this fancy thing is with your feet and do this, right? It's an about face. And I don't know, I've never been there, so I don't know what the fancy thing with your feet is, but they have these special movements and they go boom, like that. And that's what this is. It means to change your mind, it means to turn around, it applies to every part of you, it applies to your heart, your attitude, your understanding, your direction in life. This is what the word repent means. Repent means to turn around. So there's this huge difference between repent and regret. You can, people, let's say, we're all sinners, Sinners regret that they sinned. Why do they regret that they sinned? Because they got caught. Or they're suffering the consequences as they got caught. That's not repentance. Repentance is when you change your mind and go the opposite direction. So here's an example. Judas regretted what he did. It actually says that in, the ver in Matthew. Um, it's on here. Matthew 3. Uh, 3 8. No, 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 that one. No. It's on the next page. 27. It would be in 27, yeah. Matthew 27, 3 through 5. He regretted what he did. He regretted what he did so much that he took the silver and took it back to them because he regretted the consequences of his decision. He didn't, he, because he, I mean, he would have to sort of assume. So what was he hoping he would get accomplished when he betrayed Jesus? Would he was hoping Jesus would step up and say, no, you can't do that, I'm the king? You know, was he hoping to get him to advance? I don't know what he was hoping to do, but what he was not hoping was for him to be arrested and put on trial and crucified. That was, because otherwise he would have had regret. So he takes what he's trying, his manipulation, or whatever he's trying to do, and it doesn't work out the way he thinks. He gives the money back, and it actually says he regretted what he did. Of course, now they don't want the money either, because now it's blood money, they can't do anything. And he goes out and hangs himself. So he, we have no indication that Judas repented. We have a lot of indication that he had regret. And uh, you can see that, I've done that in my own life. I've thought, yes, I do not have any repentance for eating all that chocolate cake, but I do regret the number on the scale the next morning. Okay, you see the difference there? I mean, and that's a small little thing, but you may regret the consequences of your decision without regretting the sin, without repenting of the sin. There's a difference there. Uh, there's another one that you can write down. Oh, I don't see Oh, Esau did the same thing. It actually says that he saw it with tears, but he didn't take, didn't do repentance. He had regret that he lost his inheritance. And he had regret that he sold it to Jacob for a bowl of soup. I mean, a bowl of stew, lentil soup, right? But he never made room for repentance. So he didn't get that. So that's in Hebrews. It's interesting how the New Testament gives us the thoughts of the Old Testament actions a lot. Um, this one is just, someone put this one in here as an illustration of what it means to turn around. I do not know 
for sure if this is true of Orpha and Ruth specifically, but if you were going to look at two people that were given a chance to change direction, Orpa and Ruth were in Moab living under um, a very idolatrous uh, worship system of Moloch, and which was a horrible system. Um, Moloch, one of their main ways of worship was to offer babies. So it was really terrible. What they're, so they're here and they're going to go, they're starting to go with Naomi. They both cry. They both don't want her to leave. They both cry. They're both sad. They're both full of this. One changes directions and goes with her. One goes back. So one of the guys I was reading read, used that as an illustration of the story, com combined story where one person chooses this way and one person chooses this way. So that's, repent is actually pretty big. It's a pretty big concept. It, it's a huge change inside of you when you, when that happens. And you actually are to, re you would actually repent of the sins themselves. Not just getting caught for the sins. Not just the punishment that comes from the sins. You know, like, if you walk through death row, how many of those guys are regret that they got caught versus how many of them regret that they even did it in the first place? There's a difference there. There's probably, for all those who actually regret that they did it, that's the wonderful job of the prison ministries. They have an opportunity to reach these men. They, those men may stay there for the rest of their lives because they need to, because of what they did. But if they actually regret that they did it, if they actually have a repentance that they did it, they have a huge opportunity to be saved that they may not have on the outside because they may not have ever faced it. But on the other hand, if they're just in there mad because they got caught, and if they ever get out, they're going to take revenge on the cop and threw them in there. Then they are not at all close to repentance. So you guys see the difference there? Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference there. Yeah. So, no, the Lord is not slow about his promise. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you. I'm really glad he's patient towards me. <laughs> Just really glad he's patient towards me. <laughs> Not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay, so the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Um, I'm going to leave the day of the Lord to you guys as homework. <laughs> you can look some of that up or not some of that up. Um, that's not even all the verses on the day of the Lord. That's just some of them. The day of the Lord is all over the Old Testament. And it's very interesting, and exactly when that happens, exactly what that refers to, um, I've read, I've seen several things. So I'll have to have Steve forgive me if I get this wrong. So there's lots of different viewpoints. Let's say that. The cross is over here, and we're here somewhere, so that, that would make this 2,020 years, and here's us. That's us. <laughs> All right? And at some point, we've got the day of the Lord. And if you are a pre-trib person, then the rapture happens. I would have to do this, because we don't know how much time. And Jesus Christ is in the air. And then we have seven years of tribulation. If you're this. And then we have the second coming when he comes here. And there's a tiny little gap of space right here. And then there's a thousand years. And then there's Satan's rebellion again. That's called Gog and Magog. And then we have the destruction. E E S T. <laughs> ah. And heaven and 
Amen. <coughs> and then we have something called the Great White Throne Judgment. And then we have Eternity. Now there's lots of viewpoints. Lots of people think that this is happening here and not here. And lots of people think it's happening there and not there. And some people think this is allegorical and not specific. And so I'm not trying to play that out. I'm just trying to... Okay, so some people say this is the day of the Lord. And some people say, where's the middle of this? The halfway point? It's that is the day of the Lord. And some people say, that is the day of the Lord. Okay? And I'm trying to tell you that there's lots of different viewpoints on this. And um, I happen to uh, be... Does anybody remember um, the uh, movie called... Um, a Thief in the Night opened up in 1973. Oh, well, I happened to be 17, 18 years old, and I was right at the moment where, as a semi-miscellaneous, medium, strong Christian somewhere in there, <laughs> go, I need to know this, right? So Hal Lindsey comes out with his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, in 1972. I get that book. I engulf it. I still have it, and I don't know that I agree with everything now, but at that time that was answering a ton of questions in my little 18-year-old soul. And then comes the late, great, then comes the uh, Thief in the Night movie, and da-da-da-da-da, and that laid out in me my thought process for how to deal with end times. Because it often happens right at that age where you figure things out like that. So since then, I've need to, I have, and need to do still do more. Go back and revisit all these things and see am I just listening to what somebody said, or am I actually figuring out by what this says? And do I need to figure out all those details, and how many details are not clear, and are left not clear on purpose? Uh, like I told you that one time, I said like, you, you wouldn't take a kid to Disneyland and walk them through Every second of their day, you would destroy their vacation. So I did the, I, I've said this in here before, but I um, told the fifth and sixth grade class one time, I said, so what if we're taking you to Disneyland? I said, and it's going to go like this. And they're all excited, right? It's going to go like this. We're going to park the car. <laughs> and we're going to lock the doors. And then we're going to walk across the parking lot and stand in line to get through the door. And we're going to stand there for an hour. And when we get in, we're going to pay the ticket. And they finally go, I said, would you like me to continue? They go, no! I don't want to hear about the vacation like that. I said, or would you rather just sort of be a surprise? They go, I would rather, I said, because I can tell you the whole day this way. They go, no, I don't want to do that. Okay, so that was, just a little picture in my mind of why God leaves a lot of this unshown. Un <coughs> I mean, it's supposed to be this really exciting time. And whether we live through this horrible part or we don't, our God is faithful to take care of us no matter what. And if me living through this horrible part saves that family, I would do that because I would be more concerned about that family. So if I live through this terrible part, it's because God has a plan for me in that terrible part. So I'd rather not just say it. I'd rather just be like that. But if that's not the way it is, okay. I have to put my trust in the one who knows what he's doing. So... I mean, all that stuff about the day of the Lord, you get to read all that if you want to. Okay? I thought, that's as much as I thought I'd ever go into until I listen to what Steve has to say. <laughs> In which the heavens will pass away with the roar. That word for roar is, and I don't know how to say this, onomatopoetic. Um, it's in, in Greek, the name of the word sounds like what's happening. 
Okay, so if you're going to describe, and their il ex their examples are, it's like a whizzing, like an arrow goes by. That sounds like a whiz. And it sounds like a crash when the waves crash over the rocks. You know, the word itself sounds like what's happening. So the elements, the word for elements is ones in a row. And I know they haven't developed the uh, table of elements yet, but that's what the word is actually describing. It's actually describing what's going to be destroyed. Now it's going to destroy the entire universe and its table of elements, and it's referring to atoms, molecules, um, scientific things, parts of matter. Yes. And it will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth. And here's what is interesting. And its works will be burned up. All the things done on the earth that are just earthly <laughs> are going to be destroyed. Including Disneyland. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, that's someday. That's the one coming. I am really glad that I am protected from that saved from that. Uh, I have heard all kinds of theories as what's going to happen, where we will be during that time when that happens. Not sure that that's it's just theories of what we will be. One person thought that when he destroys, because it also talks about it in Revelation, he destroys the planet, he destroys the universe, and he creates a new one. And we are outside the realm of that at the time. This is one person's opinion. We actually get to watch creation. I mean, I'm hoping I get to watch creation. Wouldn't that be cool? Everybody wanted to see how that happened. I want to see how that happens. I have to watch creation. I mean, I'm hoping I get to see how the new heavens and the new earth are made. Okay. Any questions? What do you not question? Yeah. All righty. Dear Father, um, it's scary, it's exciting, it's wonderful, it's horrible, it's every, I mean, I'm all over the place with emotions on this. I am really glad that you desire that none shall perish. But I'm also really glad and thankful that you gave us free will so I could respond. Um, I, I, I'm grateful that I'm not a puppet. I'm grateful that you gave me a choice and that I can choose to love you just from my own tiny little speck of making room for you in my heart. So thank you for giving that to us. Thank you for delaying. Um, each of us have people and loved ones that need to find you. We ask that you search for them more, search for them stronger during this time of your patience and bring them closer to you. And um, thank you that you've left so much of it exciting and unexplained so that we can look forward to this with this great adventure ahead of us. Thank you for Second Peter. In Jesus' name, amen.